Okay, so this is chapter two, probability, which is kind of a funny name for a book that's also called probability, I think. But <laughs> I guess this is not the whole book, though. This is just the <laughs> basics of probability. So our goals here are to understand the slogan that seems to be the slogan of this chapter, which is understanding that probability is a measure of a size of a set. <clears throat> and in the process of doing that, we're going to review some basic set theory. Um, and explain that model of probability as a measure on sets, and then also look at conditional probabilities, which are extremely important and will probably uh, be the most important type of probability we work with in this book, is my guess, given my experience with these things in the past. So, yeah, worth paying attention to. I'm just now, FYI, I uh, because of Zoom, you've got a couple of black bars of like probably the oh, chat no. window and the controls should us as black oh, bars. Oh, that what so. those are? Yeah, it's a chat window. I don't know what the other one could be. All oh, the controls. How do I Probably, move that? I wonder. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Or just don't put anything there. If you keep it as you are, that'll be good, or that'll be fine. All right, the black like parcel at the top, though. Yeah. So I think that'll All be right. fine. I didn't realize that that did that. I didn't realize. I always there's, there's probably other. Media yeah. That had black bars I, in front. Usually, it warns I, you. It says, "Hey, this is blocking," but this uh, the the zoom windows aren't, doesn't say anything. Yeah, I didn't, I haven't ever noticed it in any of the things I've edited. So, um, I don't know, it hasn't been a problem, I guess, but I just wanted to make sure. Usually you it warns you, like, if I, if I do this, I'll say, eh, you know, please move this window, right? Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, if you can tolerate the black bar at the top, which isn't really probably doing anything, it's just the, it's just the zoom thing up there so I can see what's going on. Okay, anyway, what was I saying? Yes, conditional probabilities, the probability theory in itself, I just want to, it's like a kind of a personal note, this is like one of my favorite topics of, uh, <laughs> of math, uh, mainly because it always seems kind of mysterious in some ways, right? I mean, it's like, not mysterious, like you can't figure out what to do. It's kind of mysterious, and like you can't figure out why all this works in some ways, right? <laughs> yeah. And there's like issues of interpretation, like, you know, it's not like a straightforward thing, like you have to think about how, to, you know, how to, you don't worry about how to interpret, you know, seven inches is how long this, uh, whatever it is, right? You have, but you do worry about what probability of 50% means. Like, you know, what's the interpretation? Is it the frequency? Is it a subjective thing? Is it some popperian propensity or something? <laughs> and that's always fascinating to me. It's interesting that uh, one of my other favorite subjects, quantum mechanics also is plagued by these same difficulties. Mm -hmm. I think they're, uh, they are definitely related since quantum mechanics yeah. is a probabilistic theory as well, right? Yeah. But the interpretations are more... <laughs> fun, I would say. <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> that's a topic for some other day. Um, so I was really interested in this book, and I'm really excited about this chapter. But I have a lot of my point of that prelude is I have a lot of slides because I was taking a lot of notes for my mo own purposes. So I'm going to move kind of quickly through them. Please stop me if, uh, if I go through some part and you're like, wait a minute, that part of the book made no sense to me. Can we talk about that some more? Because that's what we're here for, right? Um, we're not here for me to reread the book to you. We're here for us to talk about the chapter. So I just want to make that clear up front in case I do fall into that trap of just, you know, telling you things and we're not sharing things. So the book opens up with a motivating example. So, so I kind of did a similar one. <laughs> I changed it a little bit. Mainly I changed it so I could match this graphic that they had in the book. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, you're not expected to understand everything on this chart, but rather this is kind of like an introduction to the to the terminology of a simple example that we know how to do. We know when you roll a die, the question here is, would I roll one dice die? And I have one here, see? Here we go. If I roll <laughs> this little blue die, right? What is, and you can see there's six possible sides and it looks very symmetric, so we expect them all to be equally likely. So we want to know the probability of getting a number less than four and also an even number when I roll this die. So we can look at by the way, when I move my mouse, you guys can see that, right? I want yes. to like highlight things or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So the set of possible results, one, two, three, four, five, six, is the sample space. So that's a term for this chapter, sample space. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's just what it is, a set of possible results. And then we have events. We have two events mm -hmm. that we're of interest in this problem. One is that the die is less than four. So that means it's a one, two, and three. So that's a set of three possible outcomes. It's called an event. And that's another little terminology thing in this book is that a set of outcomes is an event, right? That's the correspondence between an event in the physical world and an event in the model, <laughs> if you will. And another event here is the event that's even, and those are the die results of two, four, and six. Um, so those are two events, but we actually are interested in the combined event that both and, less than four and even. 
n in the set theory n translates into an intersection between those two sets the intersection of those two sets is two again these are all terms that are probably familiar with you but if they're not we're going <laughs> to dive into a little deeper um, and so finally we now know that there's only one element of the set that is the outcome we're interested in that's two now we want to translate that event into a probability we use a measure which is going to be like a function mapping sets into numbers and the mapping here is just counting because it's a simple what they call naive probability and so there's one possible result out of six it's one out of six the probability is one six now you all knew that ahead of time because you <laughs> are familiar with probability theory you're data scientists but this is like breaking it down into the nitty-gritty most possible mathematical detail <laughs> to make clear what we're talking about in this chapter, where that's what we're going to do. And the reason for doing that is for more general cases that aren't so simple, where you can't use counting, right? Yep. Continuous uh, sets <laughs> and areas, and which are the kind of things we run into all the time in data science. So this chapter is going to give a mathematical approach to probability, which may have come in before in your class, but you probably haven't thought about in this little detail in a long time. I know I haven't. And that's kind of an independent approach, independent to worrying about interpretation. So we're not going to worry about interpretation at all in this chapter, right? It doesn't matter what interpretation you have, the mathematics are the same, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so I'd like to just ask, like, everyone, do you, are you familiar with uh, sets? Is that something that, um, set theory, is that, can I go fast through the set theory thing? Or is there some people that, uh, or from your reading, maybe you're refreshed it enough for reading the chapter or? Yeah. Um... You can yeah, go I fast as you, far as I'm concerned. Go, yeah. uh, uh, fast, I would uh, set you, I think. The book did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. All right, great. So I don't, I don't think there's, I mean, I don't think there's anything that interesting in this section, to tell you the truth. There's one little interesting thing I will just want to point out when I get there, but otherwise it's relatively, the set part is relatively straightforward to me. It's like, yeah, yeah, sets. That's the beauty of sets, actually. That's why mathematics is sort of based on them. I say sort of because now <laughs> I think they've kind of gone off into other things like category theory, but... Um, but still, sets are fundamental because there's some way they're simple, right? But leave it to mathematicians to make something simple complicated <laughs> with lots of terminology. <laughs> so the basic idea is uh, sets are collections of elements, and elements can be anything, not just numbers, but anything, apples, real numbers, functions, right? I mean, you can have a set of functions. You can have a set of sets, of course. That's very important in this uh, terminology. And one piece of terminology, the subset, this is the notation here. You guys are probably familiar with that. And in just for fun, uh, to make this a little more interesting, I did some of these things in R just to show how you would do that. So if I have a set A and a set B, as I indicate here, right, I can say, if I want to know if something's a, a subset, I just have to check that all the elements are in that other one. So it's just all B in A. And yeah, all Bs are in A. That's true. It's a subset. Are all the A's in B? No, of course not, right? That's not, A is not a subset of B. So I think this is the right way to do that. Or I don't, I couldn't, yeah. there's no actual subset function, but I do, I think this is the right way to check the one that says a subset of another. I do like the idea because it makes sense. It actually says what it is. All the A's are in B's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All the A's are in B. I mean, <laughs> that seems right to me. A couple pieces of terminology. There's a, a set called the empty set, which is just indicated by this symbol with a zero with a slash through it. You'll see that a lot. And the other one is Omega, the Omega set. It's like the Omega key. Um, it doesn't open a door to the spirit world, but rather <laughs> it represents the entire, uh, all, the, all the possible elements under consideration in that particular case, right? It's a relative concept, so it depends on what particular case you're talking about. If I'm talking about this die, it's one through six. So I'm talking about this die, it's one through 20, for example. That'd be the unit Omega set. various set operations you can do just a quick refresher union of two sets is all the members it's actually kind of interesting this notation if you don't if you don't know this notation by the way because it'll come up a lot in this book is everybody familiar with this notation i'm, I'm yeah. sure so i have it, uh, seen it yeah uh, like it it's it every or i i'm good now i'll put it that way like okay good getting reviews yeah, yeah. You know, this has it's, been good reviews yeah <laughs> So all this says the union is all the members, the union of two sets A and B, the members are members such that, you can read that bar as such that usually, such that uh, the elements, their member, the elements are member, are the, the elements are elements of A or the elements are elements of B, that's it, right? So union, uh, the thing I want to 
point out here is union translates to an or here, right? Intersection means they're in both, so union logically becomes an and. Uh, Complement kind of means not, right? So it's not an element of A. It's in the universal set, but it's not an element of A. So the complement is the logical equivalent of a not function. And that's why I put that here too, right? So just, I think it's interesting to note that correspondence because they'll come up a lot. Like you want to know if something happened or something else happened, you have to take a union of sets. Uh, the <clears throat> one thing you may not have seen a lot of is a set difference, which is where you take A, uh, basically to subtract the elements of B from A. That's why it's called a difference, right? Set difference. And in uh, late uh, LaTeX symbol is set minus, by the way. So I guess you have to write that because I keep yeah. forgetting what it was. Uh, it's not set difference, it's set minus. Uh, and there's a correspondence between these complement and difference in that the difference can also be written as the A intersected with the complement of B, right? That makes sense because the members that are A but not in B. And complement can be written as a difference too. And I point this up because you ever have to take a complement in R, the way to do it is actually use a set difference because there is no, because you R doesn't know what your universe is. So instead, instead of take the right. universe and subtract the elements, you'll get the complement. <clears throat> so I show that. Um, the three three of those operations that are, you can do, which is the uh, union in R, right? Just use the union. This is actually very useful. It turns out in R, as you probably know, <laughs> uh, you have like a set of a set of indexes. You can do unions of indexes, for example, and you can do intersections of a sets of indexes. I should say vectors. I mean, there's no as far as I know, there's no maybe there is actually a package for sets, but you can just use vectors. It doesn't matter if there's if they repeat when you do set things and ignore that. It doesn't enforce their sets, but you can use unique to enforce that, right? <clears throat> um, set difference there, set diff, that's, that's the uh, R command that you'll need for taking a difference. And that's probably the only way you can get the complement of a set, since again, doesn't know what the universal set is. So you do set difference of some set that represents your omega, and then the set you're trying to complement, get the, the complement of that set. So that's hopefully totally crystal clear. Uh, important properties, these are pretty straightforward. Uh, intersection union are cumulative, they are associative, uh, and they obey the usual distribution laws for mathematics. Um, if you haven't seen De Morgan's law, tattooed on your brain because it's an extremely <laughs> useful thing to be able to go back and forth between the unions and the intersection. It's the same thing you have in logic, right? If you replace the union symbol here by an and symbol and the complement by not, the same thing holds true in logical symbols as well and is very useful in logic. <laughs> Okay, this is one thing I did want to highlight before we move on, this idea of partitioning. So uh, sets are called disjoint. If their intersection is zero, that means that they're disjoint. They're not, they're not overlapping in any way. And a collection of sets is a, called the partition of the universal set. If all of them are mutually disjoint and they completely cover the set, the union of all the, those sets covers that bigger set. And there's like a little picture here, but this is important because it lets us decompose some set and it's going to be important in probability theory when we imagine this is decomposing the event space into subspaces that we can perhaps know how to analyze better, right? Okay, so that takes us into the probability world, which is what we're trying to get to. Probability space, the book defines it as uh, comp being composed of three elements. Now, I mean, this is one of those things that seems kind of like, why do you have to go to all this level of detail? And hopefully there'll be some payoff at the end. But at least you'll know this terminology going forward. Uh, I think in, in data science, we tend to normally play pretty fast in physics too, by the way, pretty fast and loose with these kind of concepts of probability. So it's, I guess it's nice to kind of zoom in, get this kind of level of detail, and then have it in the back of your mind later. But usually if you play, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say what I was going to say because it sounds bad, but I'll just say it anyway. <laughs> usually if you play fast and loose, you don't usually get in trouble too much with these kind of things. But it's worth that's not a pe that's not advice. <laughs> that's, well, and I think I think the reason we're here is like, yep, I've been playing it fast and loose, and now I want to like get this, <clears throat> get yeah. all this stuff more firmly uh, in my toolkit. So yes, I don't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, um, so the book takes this approach to say, look, there's three elements because you probably space. There's the Universal set, that is the sample space. Sorry, it's called the sample space now. It's the set of all the possible outcomes, <laughs> right? It's the big set of all the possible outcomes. It's a set. It could be anything. It could be sides of a die. It could be measurements of uh, people's height, whatever the possible outcomes are. Then there's the event space, which is the reason why they make this separate event space thing, because the event space is now a set of sets, 
That's an important distinction, right? <laughs> the reason we have that is because probability law is a measurement that maps from these events to a number. That's the third component. And it has input. The input is sets, subsets of the, the sample space, right? And so he had this figure in here that the uh, sample spaces are interfaced to the physical world, to our experiment, whatever our experiment is, that tells us what the sample space is. And then we go from, we have events, then we have a probability model that, model that maps those events into numbers. And then that finally leads us into our, our tools for data analysis, this probability model. Usually the probability model, we're trying to actually, in some ways, uh, in data analysis, in some ways, kind of going backwards, right? Trying to take our data and try to figure out what the underlying probability model is, the process of inference, which is... Uh, <clears throat> something we'll get into later in this book, I think, but you guys are probably all familiar with that. So this is kind of the area I think on the right where we usually are working, right? We're working over here all the time. We're kind of somewhat more familiar with this side. And so I'll just go through quickly a little more detail of these things. Again, I said this already, sample space is set of all possible events. It can be anything, phase angle of a voltage, EEG signals, <laughs> images. Uh, what, oh, I just want to point out this important case here, flipping two coins where we've actually taken kind of two sample spaces, heads, tails, and kind of merge them together in this what's called the Cartesian product of sets. It's not something he mentioned in the book, but it's useful to, <laughs> to understand that terminology. If you ever see that, it's got Cartesian product, which is the outer product in some sense of these two sets. Sample space is all possible combinations of outcomes. So these are sets of sets. Uh, for example, um, the, uh, if you consider any discrete set of uh, outcomes, then there's going to be two to the n events because there's two to the n possible subsets. This is just a quick example to illustrate that. This is from the book. If you have a set of three possible outcomes, A, B, and C, the event space consists of nothing happened, A happened, B happened, C happened, it's a combination of A and B, A and C, and then A, B, and C, and then all three possibilities, right? So any, any one of them could happen. So there's eight, two to the n, eight possible events, eight possible sets, right? There are subsets of the sample space. There we go. I got the terminology. <laughs> okay. The third component is this probability law, which is a mapping or a measure. It's a mapping from your event space to real numbers. So, uh, for example, this gives a, an example where the again the event space is A, B, and C. So we can say, okay, give me the probability of B and C, right? that subset, then there's some mapping here. Here's the mapping for the individual elements. And then if you want a little probability of B and C, well, it turns out you just add them, but we haven't gotten there yet, but that's how you get <laughs> probably those two, right? This extends naturally to intervals. There's some measure. Now the measures of density, probably density as we'll learn later, but it's a weight he calls it here. And now you're gonna, you're gonna add up, integrate. The, well, actually the, the law in this case, the probability model is this integral. Right, so probably an event E from the E occurs between uh, from A and B, between A and B is the integral of f of x. That is the model. I'm just that's we're going to put we're we're saying we're putting that forward as the probability law, right? For this particular case of of events, there are the the sample space is the real number between zero and one. I really made a hash of that sentence. I hope that made sense though, right? Probably a lot can be more complicated than just a, uh, for individual events. It can be something like an integral, like in this case, this is the probability law. And so the probability law cannot be arbitrary mapping, it has to be, has to satisfy these axioms of probability, it has to be uh, non-negative, which makes sense because it's probably just shouldn't be negative, right? <laughs> and then we also impose this normalize that the probability of anything happening is one. Okay, this seems straightforward. And that's, that's an arbitrary thing, by the way, in some way, in that we've just decided that probably is go from zero to one. We could have decided something else, zero to 12, maybe if we had, you know, a different, somebody else had founded this thing, who knows, right? But zero to one is what we use. Uh, and then finally, the most important one is this additivity. We require that the probability law satisfy this axiom of additivity, that if you have a bunch of disjoint sets, the probability of the union of those sets should be the sum of the probabilities of the individual set, uh, sets, right? That's the additivity. And we need this. And it's sort of motivated by, you may say, well, that seems like where did that come from? But it's motivated by that's how it works with naive probability. We know that it's how it works with this die. If a probability of a one is one over six, probability two is one over six, probability of one over two is one over 
three, right? So that's how it works with naive counting. So generalizing that to an axiom, that's where this cave comes from. And in mathematics, that's how you do things. You say, okay, I'm gonna make this an axiom and see where it gets me, right? So that's what they did and apparently got us into a, the whole world of uh, data science. So we're happy about that. <laughs> Uh, so it gives a couple of examples. Uh, well, what, I wanted to give an example of this with that integral probability law because I think it's the non-trivial example, right? So I said before the sample space is the real number between zero and one, and my probability law is that the probability of the of an event, where the event is the number occurred between a and b, is the integral of this function f, which I'm going to give you between a and b, right? So that's the probability law. I'll just give you that's the probability law, and you say, well, let me check. Does this meet the axioms? Well. If f is greater than zero, oh, I tell you also that f is greater than zero. Okay, fine. So if f is greater than zero, then that it will satisfy axiom one. And if f is normalized, the integral from zero to one is one, then it'll satisfy the axioms. Okay. But let's check to see that it works with additive. So what if I have two integrals from a to b, another integral from b to c? We know that the the union of those two should be the line, the integral from a to c, which from the probability law should be this integral, right? probably integral from a to c of f of d of x. And hey, that works due to the additivity of, uh, that works, I can break that apart in these two integral integrals, which are probability of e and the probability, uh, e1, sorry, the probability of e2, which are the two subsets, right? So the additivity of integration gives us what we needed for the additivity of probability. Hopefully that made sense. Thought it'd be useful just to kind of that's, <laughs> this was in the book too, by the way. It's not I didn't invent this, but <clears throat> so if it didn't make sense, you can go back and look at it again. Uh let's see, corollaries quickly. Um uh, this is the probability of adding disjoint events. You've seen this a million times, I'm sure, but if the probability of A union B and A and B are no are not disjoint, that's just the probability of A plus the probability of B, but then you have to subtract off the intersection of A and B. And this figure from the book really makes that crystal clear. This gray area is this probability, right? And it seems clear if I could just decompose that. There's this left slice here. That's, uh, I'm sorry, this whole left circle here, which is probably of A. And there's the right circle here, probably of B. But when I combine them together, I get too much. So I have to subtract out this blue piece, right? It's the too much part, right? So that makes sense the, to me anyway. Yeah. When I got, in other words. It's just that it's yeah. the part that you count twice if you if you don't subtract you it out. You count twice. So that's you, right. You, that's yeah. a better way of saying it, right? Yes, you count yep. twice. Better way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, I, I get this blue part twice when I when I overlap <laughs> these and you know, add them together. So uh, an important corollary to that <clears throat> is this idea of the union bound. That is, if I can't figure out what the, the problem is really complicated, I don't know what the intersection is. I can still know for sure that the union is going to be less than the sum of those two probabilities. Probably the union is going to be less than some of those two probabilities. And that does come up a lot in data analysis. Well, maybe not in, in the in using data analysis, but at least driving some of the methods you use in data analysis, like hypothesis tests, multiple hypothesis testing, this concept is underlying that uh, in some of these bounds that they, or some of these approximations they do, they'll use this as this bound in the driving that approximation. Okay, cool. Now to conditional probability. This is where we really start getting into more interesting things from a data science perspective, because we usually are interested in the relationship between events. If A happened, what's probably the B also happens, right? Are they correlated? Is, does A somehow affect the probability? Observing A, does that affect the probability of observing B? That sounds like something data analysis, right? Um, so the, in probability theory, we just define this thing called the conditional probability. The probability of A, you read the bar as given, A given B is equal to the probability that A and B both happen divided by just the probability that B happened. And this is a definition, right? There's not something that's derived, but it's motivated by this figure here. And the book goes into a lot more detail, but it's motivated by this figure here where this is, again, the same Venn diagram we all know and love from probability theory and set theory. Um, the probability A and B, probably A intersection B is this lens, this blue lens here, right? It's, and if this was, if the, uh, if the probability law for this was just the area, then it would be the area of this blue thing divided by the total area of this rectangle, right? That'd be the probability of A intersection B. But I, want, but I now I have the new information that B definitely happened. So the idea is I now have to restrict my sample space to be just B. And now I want to know what's what's the area of this lens within the area of B. Well, that's going to be 
probability A intersects B divided by the probability B. If areas are my probability um, law. That's how I always think of, of, of motivating this conditional probability definition. So it's not, doesn't seem completely arbitrary. But I just want to point out that it is a definition in this method, in this model of probability. There are other approaches to probability where this is taken as foundational. Uh, and I want to point you to this great book called Probability Theory, The Logic of Science by E.T. Jaynes. Um, fantastic book about alternative, like logical probability theory, probably based on logic. And in that book, uh, it's based on this thing called Cox's theorem. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but um, the idea is you start with what can what what kind of laws do you probably have to obey in order for me to make rational decisions <laughs> in some sense yeah. and it's built up on conditional probability as a found a fundamental component of it rather than being a, a definition like this all probably and, and it makes sense because in that book and other books in that field kind of bayesian logic you think of all probabilities as conditional probabilities but that's true all probabilities are conditional probabilities they're always conditioned on something all right you know, just um, in the figure, I don't know, like, I don't think it ever really, really clicked of what the ratio means. And in reading this, it's, it's like, oh, it's just like, what percentage of the cases of B include yes. A? Yeah. Like, it's it's not some exactly right. magical formula, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a definition. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to give an example here uh, of this <laughs> to kind of drill this home, like how it would work. If, because this actually makes, to me, this, this example also helps make it more clear. Because I would roll two dice, what's a, and I see, okay, let's imagine I'm at the craps table, right? So I'm rolling my dice, <laughs> and, and I'm, I got all my money on eight, okay? So I roll the dice, and I can only see one of the die. The other die rolled around the, somebody else's chips or something on the table. And I see it's a two. And I'm like, oh, now what's the probability that I got an eight? Right, just in that split second, I'm such a fast calculator. I'm, <laughs> I'm worried about that, right? So, what is the outcome space for the sample space for the two dice? It's this table right here, right? These are all the two possibilities. Now, I observed a two, right? So, that reduces my sample space to just these, right? These ones and I can't do the thing, but the row, the row of twos here, right? So the this, this, I'm sorry, this row of twos and this column uh, with twos in it. it. Has to be one of those eleven possibilities now, right? Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. And so oh, I'm doing the math down here. It has to be one of these eleven probabilities, right? Eleven out of thirty-six, right, is the probability that the two appears in one die, then, right? But forget about this formula. Die. Let's forget about that for a minute. <laughs> Let's just think about this. It's got to be one of these eleven possibilities. And of those 11 possibilities, which ones of those are eight? There's only two of them. There's six and two down here, and there's two and the six. So I know from just thinking about it, I don't need to know anything else about conditional probability or nothing. I know there's got to be two out of 11. There's my new probability after that. <laughs> I hope all right, that's, I mean, you don't need to know anything else. Just know that's the event space and just look at it, right? It's pretty clear. And if you do the math using the conditional probability formula, you get the same answer because it's basically doing the same thing, right? The probability of getting an eight and a two on one, the probability of the total being an eight and one of the dice is a two. Well, there's two out of the 36 possibilities for that, right? The two and the six and the six and the two. And probably a two on one side, well, there's 11 out of 36. So the probability of that is 11 over 36. I take that ratio and I get two over 11 again. But it's all this doing. You're just reducing the sample space because you've conditioned on it. What's con and then if we did this as a simulation in R, let me scroll this down a little bit. We do the same thing. I just want to belabor this a little bit. I apologize for this. It might be taking a little bit of time, but I, just, I think this is an important concept to get well tattooed into your brain because it's going to help a lot. And this helped me tattoo it in my brain a little better. I keep saying that. Probably you guys are like, what are you talking about tattoo in your brain? That's I'm showing my age. <laughs> it's an old TV commercial. Anyway, um, the first, so I just create a random rolls, right? So uh, die one, one through six, die two, sample one through six. So now I've got two. Well, 100,000 die rolls here, two <laughs> dice, and I compute the total, right, in the most straightforward way. Now, what I'm going to do is condition, which in conditioning in uh, tidyverse is filtering. <laughs> so I only want the ones where one of the dice, one of the die with the two. So I just filter. That's the conditioning part, okay? And now I'm going to just calculate the fraction of those that are eights. 
And yeah, we get the same answer, you know, within within uh, numerical errors here. So my my story there, my, my little story there is that conditioning is like filtering. <laughs> filtering <laughs> on the outcomes. Actually, I like to think a lot. I, you'll, I do this a lot when I do my data analysis. I love simulations. I will simulate all the time. Um, my models, whatever I'm doing, I always run simulations to see if they make sense. It's a, it's a good practice. Uh, I don't, I don't feel like I do it enough. Um, and Gelman says fake data as a way of life, which has become kind of something I want to get on a t-shirt. <laughs> 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 okay. So given that now we've uh, understood conditional probability. We can now understand the concept of two events being independent. I said that like the probability of A given B, right, it's called P bar this thing, P probably A given B is uh, a thing, right? Well, what if probably A given B is just the same thing as probably A that didn't, knowing B had no effect on the probability of A, then we say those two things are independent. B has nothing to do with A apparently because I observed, like if I have uh, two dice right here, right? And I roll one die, and I see a two that has no, that's not going to affect the result of the next die. They're independent. It's pretty straightforward. If we use the definition of conditional probability, we can turn this into this kind of statement, which is also generally taken as a definition of independent probability. That's probably of A and B is the product, right? That doesn't seem as clearly obvious to me as the, the saying that probably of A given B is just probably A. That to me is just saying that's what independent means. But if they are independent, <laughs> then you can multiply them. But that works both ways. If you can multiply the probabilities, they must be independent as well. If you can probably, I'm sorry. If you can multiply the probabilities to figure out the probability of the intersection, then they're independent. This thing, there's a lot of, it's harder to say in words than this to write down for sure. <laughs> and I just give an example of this from the book again. This book gives us a really good example, I thought. You have two die roll and you have uh, the, you know, the, um, the two events are, there's two events here. The first die is a three, that's event A, and the second event is the second die is a four, right? We know probability of event A is one over six, we know the probability of event B is one over six, right? So what's the probability of the of the intersection of those two, right? Well, we can look down here, this is that same kind of thing where the two, the same thing I showed before, the 36 outcomes, there's the outcome that it's a three, and there's the outcome that it's, the second dice is a four, the intersection is this single gray square here, so it's one over 36. And that's also what the product, product of one over six and one over six is. Now, you, you, if you're looking at this thing, wait, that's totally obvious. Why do we need all this? The point of doing this obvious way is so that for non-obvious examples, you can kind of think of this picture in the back of your head of what that's what's happening. From the point of view of conditional probabilities, look at the probability that this gray square is also the probability that A given B, right? So what's the probability that the first die is a three given that the second die is a four? The, the set of outcomes of when the given we know that the second die is a four is these blue squares. Only one out of six of those is probably with a die rolled a three. And this so it's the conditional probability definition works here as well. So I'm trying to say, right? If I restrict myself to the case where the second die is a four, then there's six possibilities. Only one of those is the first die of three. So. Hopefully that made sense. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes when I try to say these things out, I realize there's a <laughs> lot of terminology that it, you have to say in a row. <laughs> All right, so sure. I probably belabored that way too much. Let's get to the Bayes theorem. Okay, so if you take uh, the definition of the probability of A given B and the probability of B given A, Right, and the book does this, and they rearrange them, you get this cool theorem called Bayes' theorem, which I appreciate John fixing my, I originally had the posture in the wrong place. <laughs> so his name was Bayes, his name wasn't Bay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so you see me write that with the posture in the wrong place because uh, English is my second language apparently. Uh, so the mathematics is my first language. <laughs> so probability of A given B, is can be written as the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. That's Bayes' theorem, but you can see this just simply a consequence of the definition of conditional probability. 
And, but the cool thing, it lets us switch the order of, of A and B. And this, of course, will come up a lot in data analysis when we want to know what the, you know, we observe, um, we observe A, we want to know what the probability, I'm oh, sorry, we observe B, we want to know what the probability of A is given that we observe B. Well, we can't do that very easily, but we might have a good model for the probability that B did occur if we knew A. And this lets us turn that around. Another uh, important uh, law here is this law of total probability, which we we'll go back to the idea of disjoint sets, which I wanted to, which I highlighted before. What it allows us to do is decompose the probability of, of B into the into smaller dis, into these smaller disjoint sets. You make press it as a sum, an expansion, as it were. Uh, probability of B given A times probability. Well, anyway, it's this sum. I'm not going to read it out. Right? This is sum. That thing. That's the law of total probability, and the interpretation. Uh, the proof of this is in the book. The interpretation is pretty straightforward. You're just chopping up that sample space, omega, into subsets A, like we did before, right? And the subsets are uh, it's a is a is a um, is a partition, right, of the of the sample space. So we just look at the parts of B that are in each of those partition and sum it all. That's all we're doing. And we're using the fact that parts of B that are in A is given by this intersection B intersect A, but we can also write that as conditional probability. By the definition of conditional probability, okay. So then, combining these two ideas together allows us to write this right here, which is another way of writing Bayes' rule, and it's like one of my favorite equations of all time in mathematics and science. Uh, comes up a lot, and it just—it's basically the same thing. But it's Bayes' rule, where we've just written it now as a probability of a given b is a probability of b given a times parts of this prior right probability of a. Divide it, and then you just have to normalize this. Actually, that's what the bottom is really expressing, right? Just have to sum up all the other possible outcomes that could have happened, uh, and their posterior probability as well. I just threw some terminology in there. In Bayesian logic and Bayesian uh, analysis, uh, this probability of a sub j given b is called the posterior probability. This p of a is called the prior, and this thing right here, this conditional probability, is called the conditional probability in the book, but it's also often called the likelihood. The likelihood, right? And just to, um, uh, for example, I guess it just needs a little more help to make this more clear. But suppose A sub J was some uh, model, right? That you're trying to evaluate. Um, you want to know what's probably my model is right, given my data B, right? So then you have to say, well, it's going to be the probability that I would have observed that data B, given my model, times the prior probability that model is correct, divided by now the normalization over all the other possible models, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> What are you doing here? All right. And if you've done any Bayesian analysis, you know that the, the key thing in Bayesian analysis is this, this sum of the de denominator here is extremely, can be extremely difficult and leads to fun things like Markov chain Monte Carlo and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got a few minutes left to go over this example, this famous uh, Monty Hall problem, which allows us to flex our conditional probability. Things. In the book, they did the three prisoners problem, which uh, I just want to highlight that this Monty Hall problem is, in, is a similar problem, but uh, in my opinion, somewhat more fun. <laughs> it's inspired by an old game show, which is not actually an old game show. It's still on, turns out, but the Monty Hall version of it is an old game show from the, I think, I guess they ran up until the 80s, maybe, but it started in the 60s. It definitely. had a long run. Yeah, definitely through the 70s. Oh, let's make a, yeah, called Let's Make a Deal. And the idea is this, you're a contestant on the show, Monty Hall, who's the host, right? Uh, that's why it's called the Monty Hall problem, gives you three doors. He says, okay, behind one of these doors is a great prize, a trip to Puerto Rico or something. And behind the other two doors is some kind of uh, zonk. They use goats in this example, right? Something worthless behind the other two doors. So you pick a door, you're, let's say you pick door number one doesn't matter which door you pick, so we're going to say you pick door number one. Now, you, before you open the door, Monty wants to make a deal. He says, okay, hold on a second. He opens one of the other doors, and he reveals goats behind that door. Now, he says, hey, do you want, he opens door number three. He says, do you want to switch? Do you want to keep door number one, which you already have, or you can switch to door number two? And the question is, should you switch or not? It turns out in practice, people tend to not switch. They tend to stick with their original choice. Because I think the people sometimes when interviewed, they would say, oh, I thought I had like a 50-50 shot at it. So I figured I'll stick with what I already got. Go with my gut or something, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, you had a one-third chance of having the right one at the beginning. Why would that change? You should still only have a one-third chance, right? So you should switch 
to the other door. Now that other door has to have a two thirds chance. And this was a fascinating problem that caused all kinds of arguments on the internet back in the Usenet days, forums. Um, a famous uh, columnist, Marilyn Boss Savant, uh, got in arguments with PhD mathematicians about it. And she had the right <laughs> answer, by the way. Yeah, and I couldn't anyway, remember which direction that went. But. <laughs> and the Wikipedia um, for this, if you look at Wikipedia Monty Hall problem, there's a whole bunch more to say about this problem. That I definitely recommend looking at it. There's like a Mythbusters episode. It's, it's fun stuff. But we're going to just model it, right? So let's model it. So let D1, D2, and D3 be the events at the prizes behind door one, two, and three. And we're going to assume it's randomly assigned. So the probabilities are all equal and equal to one over three. And then we'll call the events uh, Monty Hall opening each door, M1. The M1 means Monty open door one. M2 means Monty open door three. M3 equals Monty open door three. So now we pick door number one, okay? And we're going to assume the Monty opens door number three, revealing a goat. So this can, we can condition now on the prize location what the probability is that Monty would open door number three, because that's the one, that's the data we observe, right? The observe, observation data here is that Monty opened door number three. We want to see, does that affect the probability of the prize is behind door number one, right? That's, that's the question put into <laughs> concrete terms. So what's the probability that Monty would open up door number three, given that the prize, we have the prize on so door number one. In that case, it's one half because Monty would open either door. It doesn't He has no preference, right? Opening one door or the other. They're both empty. Uh, I guess I should say one inline assumption here is Monty always opens the door with a goat. Okay. Monty knows where the prize is. He always opens the door with a goat. He never would open up the door and show, oh, there's the prize you lose. That's no fun, right? So he's going to always open up a door with a goat. So there's a one chance, one half chance that um, he would open up door number three and a, a one half chance he would open up door number two because either one would be suitable because they both have goats. Now, if the goat is actually behind door number two, he has to open door number three. He's not going to open up the door, the, the door number two where the prize is, right? He has to open up door number three. And finally, if the prize is actually under door number three, there's no chance he would open up door number three like he did. So that's a zero. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yep. So now we've got all the ingredients we need to put those into my favorite formula and get the answer. And that's what <laughs> I do down here. I just put it in there, right? So the probability, so I want to know what's the probability that the prize is under door number one, my door, given that Monty opened up door number three. So I use Bayes' rule to turn that around, right? To asking, okay, what's the probability that you, I'm going to use the probability that he would open door number three, given that I had the prize, times the probability that, that, that I have the prize. And then I have to normalize about all the other possibilities. That's what we're going to do, right? So we just put that in. That's what I'm doing here. Do the math. And I get one third. It's still one third. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because as we intuitively might have thought, well, depending on how your intuition works, some people's intuition said 50%. But my intuitions, well, I've, saw, I've seen this problem for a long time, so my intuition has been spoiled. But um, is that doesn't matter that Monty opened a door. It's independent, right? There's that independent again. The probability that I have the prize is independent of Monty opening the door made no difference whatsoever. So I should definitely switch now that I have only one other choice. So I, like I said before, it's surprisingly people don't normally switch. In a, there's a Mythbusters episode for this, which I haven't watched yet, but I do want to watch. But in the Wikipedia article, they tell us that 20 out of 20 volunteers in some mock-up of this uh, show None of them switched. <laughs> Often they were said that they thought they had a 50-50 chance. They just wanted to go with their gut, right? Not one of the 20 people switched. Not one of the people knew about this problem, apparently. <laughs> but you definitely want to switch. And I make a note here, because I've, when I've had to argue with this uh, people before, I usually try to say, look, suppose there was 100 doors and you picked one. Now there's only one in 100 chance you got the right door. And now Monty goes to and opens up, nine, not 99, I should say, I've got to fix it. It should be eight go doors. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, 90, I realized that after. Yeah, 98 goat doors, and there's one other door there. It should be obvious at that point that that's the door where the prize has to be, right? It still, it like, before. it still feels like, like, it, it's really still hard to see the, yeah, but, he, I mean, he didn't open up my door either, you know, so of the two yeah. doors, <laughs> you know, but, but. It's, you know, you had a one in a hundred chance and now you have. You still do. <laughs> a, 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 well, and on the door you're on, you still have a one in a hundred, but the other ones are, you know, yeah. the, all the other choices collapsed into one door. That, one door. Yeah. You know, exactly right. all of your other possibilities are now 
inhabited in one door. So 99 out of 100 there. That's, yeah. Still breaks my brain, but it's, it works. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's a fun problem. Mm-hmm. So, hey, I said I like simulations. I do like simulations. So let's simulate yeah. it. And I, I, so I do a 10,000, not a very large. I could have done a lot more, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, here, here's my samples, right? I'm going to sample one, two, and three. That's a, this, that's where the prize is. So I have 10,000 samples here. Uh, the first column is where the, where the prize actually is. And the second column is going to be what door Monty opened, right? And what door Monty opens depends on where the prize is. That's the conditional probability aspect of this, right? Mm-hmm. So if the prize was under door number one, I said he picks one at random. There it is. He's picking one at random, two or three. If the prize is in door number three, I said he would pick number three. If the do- prize is in door number three, he has to pick up a door number two. This is just the logic of the problem put out into the simulation. And what I like about simulations, is it's easier to get them right in some ways, right? Because <laughs> so I'm just going to type in there what I think is going on and what my model is. And so if I run this simulation, right? Well, it's run already. If I take this, the results of this simulation and I filter it, there's my conditioning on the observation that Bonte opened door number two, right? That's my filtering. That's my observation. That's how it translates in the simulation. And then I now look, okay, what's probably the doors in price of one? It's one third. It's what you expect. But what I like about this is more straightforward. There's no, it's hard to get this wrong, in other words, right? I really just put in here what my assumptions were directly. I don't have to worry about getting the math right in some ways, right? It just works. Right. <laughs> and I just want to close with uh, that there are some alternative assumptions that people sometimes have used in this problem. And this may sometimes causes the argument. One person has one set of internal assumptions. The other person has the other set of, another set of assumptions. And I think this is important for data analysis. It's always important to make clear your assumptions from the start. And the, the argument between Marilyn uh, von Safat and other people sometimes came down to what these assumptions were. She did not make clear necessarily in her initial article. She just thought it was obvious what the assumptions should be, how much it should offer. <laughs> but there's other assumptions. One, I don't see people mention this one very much, but the evil Monty, where Monty uh, only asks you to slit, only brings up the switching idea if he knows you have the prize, right? <laughs> right. So if he knows you have the prize, he'll offer this switching thing. If he knows you don't have the prize, he says, okay, let's open up your door. He doesn't ever, ever give you a, a, an option. If that, if evil Monty is the case, then you definitely should never switch, right? The other, but the other one more common assumption that people made is that Monty actually doesn't know. There's a chance he could open a door with the prize. Oh, no, that's where the prize is. Let's open door number two. Oh, you, there's the new car. You blew it, right? Uh, that could be the way Monty operates. Uh, and in that case, using the same kind of conditional probability, we can show that now it's true. It is 50-50, right? The probability is 50-50. And we can do a simulation here just to make concrete what that assumption is. Here I'm sampling one, two, and three, what the door of the prize is. And now I pick door number one. Monty can pick door number three. He just picks it at random. Could have a prize, could not have a prize, right? And now my conditioning is the what actually happened was door Monty opened door number two, and we didn't see a prize. That's the conditioning. Okay two things happen, right? He opened the door and there was, happened to be, happened to be, there could have been now in this model, there could have been a prize, but there wasn't. When I do that filtering, I find out, yeah, it's about 50% from the, from the simulation. So I think sometimes people maybe have that model in the back of their mind too. It's like, oh, he didn't know, but he does know in the, in the common where you phrase the problem. And then the prisoner's problem as well, it's the same thing. Okay, so that is Basic probability theory. I talked a lot. Um, many people were silent. Hopefully that made sense. This is the last uh, five minutes or so. If anyone has any parts of this chapter that confused them that they wanted any clarity on, and I can try to see if I, there's any, let me just stop sharing here for me. Try to, maybe I can provide some clarity, maybe not. I thought it was mostly pretty straightforward. I found that the business of having to worry about event spaces and sample spaces and stuff was like, oh, is this, this could be hard to keep my brain because I don't think I usually think this way, but um, we'll yeah, see we'll see how the, the problems. The go. Yeah, we'll see how the problems go. I haven't done the problems yet. Yeah, this felt much less scary <laughs> than uh, you know the yeah. like you were saying. The review chapter was a whole bunch of stuff that you have to review, and so it felt like oh my god, this uh, book is going to be impossible. Um, 
but this chapter felt a lot more straightforward because it was just about one thing you know <laughs> like it was here's probability and I, I don't know I liked the um uh what did you call it the the slogan that um yeah probability is you know measure probability. of size of, of sets um thinking of it that way yeah that works well um I don't want to monopolize. I think Abdu came off mute, so. Yeah, yeah, I think it was it was quite interesting. Yeah. I I am heard about the variations of the Monty Hall problem about the evil Monty and ignorant Monty. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. <laughs> I think my favorite, uh, my favorite conditional probability example is, um, I think it was um, at the height of the AIDS epidemic in Africa, and they were trying to interview people about um, sexual habits, and people wouldn't answer honestly, and their all their results were crazy, and you know didn't match with what they were actually seeing when they would could more directly observe, uh, observe things. And they started doing where they would bring um, a box with a die in it. And they say, oh, okay, yeah. shake up the box and you look in it. I won't be able to see. And if it's a one, two, or three, tell me the truth. If it's a four, five, or six, lie. And therefore, I don't know what your answer or whether your answer is true or false. And it's, you know, they're asking like yes or no questions. Um, and so given that they knew the probability of it, of them telling the truth, they could use that conditional probability to work out the actual um, incident, you know, like what would they have said? And if you look, they don't know what any individual, whether they were lying or not, but they know the whole population of who they interview. And they were able to get much more accurate survey results by doing that, um, where the, the in-person surveys would match anonymous surveys is basically what it came out to. Um, it was really cool. Like it's just, it's just conditional probability. You can work that out. You can, you know, given what we saw, what is the actual incidence? Um, anyway, I thought that was cool. I do. I do love that example too. I only <laughs> learned about that maybe like a year ago. And I remember thinking that's such a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Actually, somewhere, somewhere there's a big discussion about it too. Where people are like, well, maybe not because, you know, if people that you're doing this to really think about, it, they might realize that, they could, you know, the, the police or whatever could still use this to filter out some more suspects to look at in more detail or something, right? So it's not quite perfect, right? You have to make the, you can make it better by making the probably the answer truthfully lower, but then right. that also makes your data more noisy when you try to analyze it yourself. So yeah, and there's, I think there's some the, interesting trade-offs in that though. I think they have done different levels of it too, depending on how big of a sample they're going to be able to take and, you know, how important it is to get the exact rate and things like that. But there have been various cases where you know you just it's better than not doing it like you're still probably going to have yeah, some people who lie even when there's the die, die says to tell the truth but they lie less often so you get closer to the real uh ratio so cool All right. Well, hopefully that was useful to everybody. Uh, everybody enjoyed that chapter. I still felt that I was maybe too much reading or too much like it was almost like I was lecturing. I want to I want to be more interactive, and I got to work on that myself. I think, but I can add more interactive elements maybe <laughs> to these things. To draw people out. <laughs> All right. Well, I will see. I guess I'll see everyone in uh, three weeks, um, probably. But many of you will see each other right. next week. <laughs> yeah, and I'll right. work on, oh, there's only, yeah, I'll work on these exercises. I'm not going to, I don't know which ones I'll do, but I'll do some of them at least before next week. See you then, guys. All right. Yeah, all right. See you. Yeah, all right. Thanks.